invite you to open to Psalm 46. <clears throat> Psalm 46. And I'll give you a moment to get there. And then I'm going to read. And we will continue from there. Beginning in verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth, He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. This is God's word. Let's pray. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Many of us are waiting for you, and not one of those who are waiting for you will be disappointed at your coming. Come now in this time as we gather before you and before your word and visit us. Cause your light to shine in our hearts. Cause the words that you've revealed to find a home in our hearts to produce lasting fruit. We pray that you would open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your word because we pray it in the strength, in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may have noticed that in my prayer, I invoked the second coming of the Lord. And this is not something original with me, it is something that I have just recently picked up from the church we've been attending. And that is not the only thing that I have picked up from this church, but I have also picked up a wonderful uh, liturgical gem, and it is this, when the pastor comes to the platform to officially begin the service, he will say to the congregation, the Lord be with you, to which the congregation will respond in unison, and also with you. And I appreciate that, not just for its liturgical beauty, but I also value it for the depth and the significance that it is communicating at the beginning of our time together, that we are reaffirming to each other that we aren't here alone, but that rather God is with us, and that it is the presence of God that makes our time here meaningful and purposeful. Now, this is actually what the psalmist, in his own measure, is seeking to um, in reinforce upon the thinking of anyone who would read this psalm. The psalmist is seeking to make the truth of the fact that God is with us to bear upon the hearts of God's people in a way that they come to a place where their complete outlook on life is one of absolute confidence. Confidence that lasts even through chaos. God is with us. He is our refuge. He is our defender. And we run to him. Now this psalm belongs to a collection of songs that highlight the significance of Jerusalem in the life of God's people and how it works and functions in his relationship to them. 
And the driving motive of the psalm is very clear, and it's this. The protection that God affords his people at all times, and thus the trust and the faith that this protection is to elicit and spring forth from the heart of God's people. Now, as we look at the psalm, I think the psalm actually uh, divides itself quite naturally for us, and so we don't need to get clever, but we'll just follow the divisions that it provides for us. And so in doing that, I have three divisions that I'd like to give. And the first of all, we see a confident declaration. A confident declaration. It comes to us by way of verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed. Now, in this declaration, the psalmist pictures God for us poetically as a refuge to point to the fact that in the spiritual sense, he is. Now, if you've grown up in any church that sang hymns, or if you've just uh, been outside or whatever, you may understand that these words are very similar to the words that we find in Martin Luther's song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, A Bulwark Never Felling. And that would be a correct observation because this is the psalm that Martin Luther drew upon in order to write that hymn. God is pictured for us here in this declaration first and foremost as a fortress. Now to the people of Israel, when this psalm was written, they had much more occasions to see an actual fortress. You and I, we probably got to drive up the coast somewhere or maybe go down south or somewhere along the eastern seaboard. But they understood very well what a fortress looked like and the functions of a fortress. A fortress was a place that people who were under threat and attack could run to to find shelter and safety. And so the psalmist is affirming for us that God is such for you and I, that he is the fortress that we run to. And so the declaration has in the first place a declaration of the refuge that we find in God, and then secondly, the absence of fear that is the result of that. Because God has so provided himself for us, therefore we will not fear. And in the third place, this is true in every circumstance. He's a firm fortress, he's a refuge, we will not fear no matter what happens, even though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea and everything else that he says there in those verses. Now, it is this declaration that is going to set the tone for the rest of the psalm, and it is this declaration that the psalmist is going to, on the one hand, demonstrate and develop and apply in other scenarios. So in the first place, let me just point your attention again to the language of the psalm in verse 1, where God is our refuge and our strength. God is the place that we run to to find protection. But God is also the place that we go to to find power. Or if you want to put it like this, he is the source of our safety and security, and he is the source of our strength. In other words, the sufficiency of God is perfectly provided in what he gives to us in himself. He protects us, and he enables us to go through the various things that we go in our course of life. And the psalmist is saying that God has so pledged himself to the cause and to the care of his people. God defends his people. God is the protector of his people. And he is available to aid his people at all times. And so the natural implication is that you and I, as we go through our lives and we go through the different things that we go through, we are to turn to him and run to him at any time that we need it. We aren't the type of people that need to be running around to self-help gurus or to anything else for that matter, or even to our pastors. We all have access to this wonderful God who has so made himself available to us. And we run to him for safety, and we run to him to draw strength. Now, I don't want to belabor this point, but I want you to also pay attention to the language again of verse 1. It says, God is our refuge. In other words, God doesn't come alongside and say, you know, I can see what you're going through. I think that you could use some help, and you, it's a good thing that you know me because I know where you could find it. Uh, it's over here, just step one, step two, step three, and then you do that, you'll be good. You could come back and you can affirm that I was correct in such a, a direction. 
No, rather God says, as he says to Abraham, I am your shield and your exceeding reward. In other words, God says, all that you need, you come to me and you will find it and you will find it in abundance. God himself, the person of God. Now, all of this, doesn't this presuppose the fact that you and I know God? That we actually have a vital living relationship with him. And it could be that you're here today and you go, well, I know about doing things for God. I know about praying to a cosmic, distant God. But I don't know anything about an intimate, personal relationship. Well, then none of this is going to make sense until you get that squared away, is it? But this is the God who comes to us and he says, I am available to you. As the psalmist says in Psalm 91, you are my refuge and my fortress, my God and whom I trust. In other words, I come to you for everything that I need. And he is available. The almighty God. The eternal God. The everlasting God who spoke the world into existence and sustains it by the strength of his word. The very God who rules the course of human history. The God who marches throughout human history and he calls people and he builds nations and he sets kingdoms up and he tears kingdoms down and he sends his son to deliver the world. And the very God who as the children may be singing in the other room has the whole world in his hands. That very God who is strong and mighty makes himself available to the Christian at every moment. And he is present and available. But notice, he is always available. The words say he is a very present help in trouble. There's something, and you're going to hear me say it a lot throughout this psalm, these are beautiful words. Oh, this isn't just neat doctrine, this isn't just poetic, and this just isn't it kind of flowery speech. These are beautiful words, are they not? A very present help. Or in the words of another writer in the Bible, God is near to those who call on him. You see, God never leaves us alone, does he? The fact of the matter is that God is with his people at all times and in all places, and it just takes a simple acknowledgement on their part for them to benefit from everything that he would desire to give them. He never abandons his children. Never once have you found a child of God who could say and say it in truthfulness as far as true truth is concerned. God has left me and abandoned me and completely forsaken me. Never. As he says to Israel in the Pentateuch, in Deuteronomy, you remember the words. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And what is true of his words to Israel are true to the people of God in all ages. That he will never leave you nor forsake you. And he's always there and he's always ready to help you. And so we have here just something that's very fundamental to our Christian faith. Is it not? The fact that God has committed himself to us. And it's profoundly comforting. And these are the things that the psalm is declaring and celebrating without any apology, saying, this is the God that I serve. The nations around me, they've got it all messed up. They don't know what they're doing. They worship a God over here. They want rain. They worship a God over here because they want sunshine. They worship a God over here because they want babies. They're all over the place, but I don't need to do that. My connection is to the one true God who rules heaven and earth. And this is one of the marvelous things about being a Christian, is it not? It should blow you away. God is readily available to you. And this is the sort of things that we can say. God is my refuge. God is my strength. A very present help in trouble. And again, let's just point out, it's not about his willingness or his availability in these matters. It's just about our awareness and our desire to appropriate these truths and apply them to our lives. So let's just do this again. God is our refuge, our strength, a very present help in trouble. You know, it's funny, they introduced me, uh, at least in the first service, as somebody who went to Bible college with Pastor Josh. Actually, Josh went to Bible college with me, but perhaps that's just a matter of interpretation. And I couldn't help but think of, in Bible college, it's a funny place, it's a good place, but it's funny, and... Um, when we talk about the presence of God, very often we picture a room with very dim lights and we have candles 
and we have some mats on the floor, and the music is very soft, and somebody's swaying over here, and then you have these peculiar worship postures over here. You're like, are they okay? Is their back messed up? I don't know, they're just worshiping. All that's good and well. But what the psalmist is talking about is something quite different, isn't he? He's saying, I sense the presence of God, and God is present with me in the midst of my perplexities, in the midst of my trials, and in the midst of my hardships. Actually, the presence of God, if you think about it, comes to us in the midst of a noisy world that would try to drown out his voice. It comes to us in an aggressive world that is antagonistic towards his purposes in our life and seeks to overthrow us at all times. And it's in those moments that the psalmist says, I will not fear, no matter what comes my way, regardless of our circumstances. Again, these words are great, aren't they? Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, why God is a very present help in trouble. It actually should be translated plural, they suggest, and troubles. That is, the trouble in your life and my life isn't a one-time and done thing, is it? Oh, it would be nice if it was that way. Yeah, I became a Christian, and then like two weeks later, I had a little bit of pride, or, you know, I had a little bit of a hardship. But after that, it's just been smooth sailing. Nothing else bad has happened. I mean, I'm good. I've been to the third heaven multiple times. All of these wonderful things. Yeah. Troubles. Multiple. Various. Trouble after trouble after trouble. And it is in times of hardship and opposition that the Christian looks at these things. And because he understands the nature of his God, that he says, I will not fear. This is the outlook of the Christian, is it not? A Christian is completely inconsistent for a Christian to be overcome with and dominated by fear. Why? Well, he's been loved with the perfect love. What does perfect love do? It casts out fear. What does perfect love look like? It looks like God having his bleeding son hanging on a cross in order to purchase sinful people like you and I and everybody else for that matter back to him. And so your complete outlook on life is one of confidence. But the interesting thing is if you look at not only the world around us but the church in general as well, what's with all the fear? I had a conversation with a woman from Texas and um, you could just imagine what that was like because she was from Texas, and so she had a lot of personality. And we talked about a number of different things, some of which I probably shouldn't repeat, but she said at one point to me something very profound, in my opinion. She says, you know, where did all this fear come from in the church? You see, the world about us is fearful, are they not? What do you think drives the media outlets? Fake news, that's the new thing. What's fake news supposed to do? Make you scared. Why? Because it engenders fear, and it keeps you going back to the source to keep seeing what's going on. And the media holds people in their grips in this regard, don't they? And then on the other hand, you don't just have people that are consumed with politics in the media saying, oh, what's going on in Korea? What's going on in Russia? What's, what's going on with Trump? What's going on with the economy? What's going on with the market? What's going on with oil? What's going on with ISIS? And all of these different things. Then you have the discernment bloggers who come to the church and they say, listen, guys, you, you need to be really scared because there's some pernicious doctrines that are starting to come into your church. And if, if you don't watch it, because I, I noticed that church had a little bit of light during worship. And, you know, believe me, that's the first step. Next thing you know, you'd be sacrificing chickens and chanting all these weird things. And um, you're going to be apostate just like the Bible says. So everybody needs to be on red alert. That's scary. You're right. That's scary. You should be fearful. Well, what do we do? Well, we need to gather over here in a little corner. And we need to set a little bulwark between us and the rest of the Christians. And then we need to make sure that we constantly attack them with our words. And Christians buy into it. And let me tell you, is that a very helpful picture of how the church should be? Am I saying that we should just accept any doctrine? No. Definitely not. Not if you know me, I would never say that. But the fact of the matter is so many people want to cultivate fear in the people of God. And that's a very unhealthy thing. As a matter of fact, it is completely inconsistent with really what it means to be a Christian. Because the psalmist is saying here, the person who understands the magnitude and the implications of what we see here, God is our refuge, God is our strength, a very present help uh, in trouble. The God of Jacob is with us. The Lord of hosts. 
They don't look at life through a perspective where they're constantly panicking. But rather, they approach life with a sense of unbridled confidence. They say, be that what may, whatever comes my way, I know this, God loves me, and he's a true God, and he is for me, and he stands with me, and he stands behind me, and he goes before me, and he holds me in the palm of his hands. And therefore, I don't need to worry about all the garbage that people are trying to get me worried about, because I know this, my God is true, and my God is near, and he is the one who rules the earth. He's a commander of the cosmos. And he is the one who intimately loves all my soul. And this is the very faith that sustains the martyr in the uh, arenas in Rome. This is the very same faith that sustains the martyrs as they go through the fire. And this is the very same faith that sustains the people of God in all ages. God is my refuge. I won't fear. It's a completely different outlook than what you find in very often in the contemporary church. Everything is so self-focused, everything is so programmatic, and everything is so fearful. Rather than the strong commitment to these truths that God is with his people. And it is this that has given the church, by the grace of God, the ability to have stability in an unstable world. And this lack of fear and this confidence, it is something that lasts throughout all circumstances, isn't it? Again, notice the words here. In verse 2, we will not fear. And then he says, even though. Even though. Now what he says here in verse 2 and 3 is he pictures the world actually falling apart. Just as in the beginning, God brought the dry land out of the chaotic waters and he subdued it and he put man on that land so that man could live because man can't live in water. The psalmist is saying, if those mountains go back into the sea and if the earth goes through a dramatic process of decreation, even then we won't fear, even when the world is falling apart. Actually, isn't that how it feels sometimes, though? Like the world is falling apart. For some of us, we're much more dramatic and much more uh, impatient when we make those declarations, but yet some of us, we feel that quite often, don't we? Like the world is completely falling apart even though. You see, we all have our respective even those, don't we? You see, in this room, there are a number of different things that in your life you are very aware of would constantly try to call you to fear. And so we all have this even though sickness, even though family, even though finances, and on and on and on and on. And we could all just have a little fill in the blank and I can hand out the card. And believe me, you'll say, I don't need just one line. I need about five or six lines because I got about five things in my life that are hard, five things in my life that are trying, five things in my life that make me want to fear. But when we understand again God's commitment to us and the strength of that commitment, we look at these things and we say, as hard as it is by the grace and the mercy of God, we will not fear. Like I said, I don't know what your even though is. Just like you don't know what my even though is. The fact of the matter is, I come here today, and I don't know everything you're going through. I'm not even going to assume that I do. And I come here today, and you don't know everything I'm going through. And this isn't about me today, so I'm not going to talk about it. But we all have these things. We all have our hurts and our hang-ups and our heartaches. And you know it's true. And it can be hidden as well as possible from the person next to you. But it's there, isn't it? And it is God in that secret place that communicates to you his protection. And you say, I won't fear. Because he holds you, and he walks with you through it, and he keeps you. Speaking of hymns, I grew up in a church that sang hymns, and I'll never forget the man that led the hymns, uh, mainly because he wasn't a very good singer. And as much as I tried to get his voice out of my head when I remember these hymns, nonetheless, I can appreciate the words of the hymns. Maybe you grew up singing this song like I did. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say, 
on and on till you get to this wonderful phrase, he lives, he lives, he lives today, he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way, he lives, he lives, salvation to impart, if you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart, what does he say? He walks with me and talks with me. I wonder if you have that view of God. Or is God just up there? Oh, isn't this also what we're trying to teach the children back there? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's actually pretty good. You have the gospel, Jesus loves you, and then you have the authority of the Bible, for the Bible tells me so. But then what do the children go on to say? It's not just authority, and it's not just the gospel, it's God's daily presence with them. Jesus loves me still today, walking with me on the way. And that's the marvelous thing about being a Christian is that as we go through the course of our daily affairs, God is with us. And trouble does not mean that God has departed from us, but rather trouble is an opportunity for God to demonstrate the fact that he continues with us and that he keeps us. Have you ever noticed that it seems to be that those who know pain know God's presence the best? I have. Now let me just think with you about some New Testament figures in order to reinforce this. In the first place, let's think about the Apostle Paul. I spoke with somebody after the second service, and he was saying, you know, I could never be Jesus, and I could never be the Apostle Paul, but I could be, and he said, this person in the Bible. We have this greater than, larger than life view of the Apostle Paul, right? Well, his life wasn't all that great on, on, very, on very many human levels, right? You picture Paul out there floating on a plank in the Mediterranean in the middle of winter. You know, we think of Mediterranean, and we're like, oh, it's holiday, we get to eat good food. Paul in the Mediterranean in the middle of winter in stormy seas, floating on a piece of wood, holding on to the promise of God. And Paul would describe his life as hardship and affliction and perplexities and trials and persecutions. Yet in the end of it all, he could still say things like this that he says to the church in Corinth. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies, who comforts us in our tribulation. Or he could say things like he says uh, to the Corinthian church in the very same letter. He says, I consider all of these things not to measure against the weight of glory to be revealed in us because these are temporal sufferings. But God was comforting him. And then you think of Jesus. Everything that Jesus said was good. Some stuff he said lands home on a day like today even more so, doesn't it? Where Jesus, speaking to the disciples, says that he will build his church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Or he says in John chapter 10 to them, he says, you belong to me, you're my sheep. You've heard my voice and I've called you by name and you follow me and you are in my hand and you are safe and you are secure there. And then as he's preparing the disciples to leave, you remember what he says in John 16, verse 33, if you're taking notes, he says, I have spoken these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Notice it's not an either or. Well, either I have peace or I have tribulation, but there's no way in our, in our mind that we can marry the two. Jesus says, oh yeah, you better marry the two because that's the reality of living in a fallen world. You will have peace that passes understanding in me, but as long as you are in the context of this fallen world, you will have tribulation. Well, that doesn't sound very good, Jesus. When you told me that we're, this whole thing about peace, I thought that's very good. You're going to go to the Father. This is wonderful stuff. You're going to come back, send in the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm really ready for this. What are you talking about this tribulation stuff now? Yeah. But be of good cheer. How in the world do you want me to be of good cheer? You just told me I'm going to have tribulation. Because in me you have peace. And I have overcome the world. Or as Paul would put it, if God is for us, who can be against us? Wow. I mean, does that not blow your mind? Again, look at verse one. Our refuge, our strength, our very present help. 
The question is, is this the sort of perspective that we have on life? Because adversity and opposition and trying circumstances don't affect God's preserving power and protection in our lives one bit. God is who he says he is. And God does what he says he will do. So that's the confident declaration of present help. And then we have a certain expectation about a promised hope. In verse 4, you'll notice that the imagery shifts from the chaotic waters, which would overwhelm the psalmist, to a river that provides peace and serenity through its streams. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. Again, I find myself, as I prepare for this, um, feeling, on one hand, completely unfit and unworthy to try to explain such a piece of beautiful literature to people. On the other hand, constantly stopping on certain phrases and being amazed. Actually, there's something very intriguing about this little word, this, this, this river. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God. That's a very intriguing sentence to me. Now, I don't know if that's because I'm from Bakersfield. <laughs> that's not, don't be jealous. That's what I have to tell research, because everybody laughs when I say I'm from Bakersfield. I say, don't be jealous. Well, in Bakersfield, the Kern River, which comes down the Kern Canyon, it um, very often is dry. For years, it's been dry once it gets down into the city. And so people would always make fun of me, imagine that, for being from Bakersfield. And they would say, man, you know, I hear about all these people drowning in Bakersfield. I don't even see any water in that thing. Like, you guys must be really stupid. <laughs> and you drive by now, and you're going across the West Side Parkway, and then you see this water streaming. There's just something nice about it. Now, he may have in mind what he says to us in Psalm 36, verse 8, where he says, I caused them to drink from the river of my delights. And so what we have here is a picture of God's people surrounded by trying circumstances, yet living in absolute serenity and absolute satisfaction. So you have a river, and the river, he says, is going through a city. Now, the city has to be none other than Jerusalem, even though Jerusalem doesn't have a river at this time, because there is the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of the Most High, surely a reference to Jerusalem. Surely a reference to Jerusalem. Well, then, what are we to make of this? In the first place, I want to point out about the river several things. The river to us is a picture of delight. Delight. Notice how it says the river comes and it makes glad the city of God. Again, God's people, though surrounded by trying circumstances, are in the posture and in the enjoyment of safety and security, and they are satisfied, and they are marked by tranquility, drinking from the very goodness of God himself. You see, it's not that God says, come to me for help, I'll protect you, but have a miserable time. He said, you come to me, I'll protect you, and we're going to have a good time. This is going to be the best time you've ever had, because I myself am going to give to you of my life. And then you have the delight of the river, and then you have the dwelling of God in the city. Notice how it's described here again. God is in the midst of her. It's the holy place of the tabernacle most high, and she shall not be moved. So you have God dwelling with his people, and then you have God delighting his people by means of the river, and he is in the midst of his people. Again, isn't that what makes coming to church special? It's not the donuts and the coffee. And it's not the fact that you don't have to watch your kid for an hour and a half. For some people it is. But what makes the gathering of God's people so significant and meaningful? You know, very often we talk and we come together and we say, God, we invite you to come. God, you know, God must be thinking, wow, thank you. I, I'm very privileged to be among such esteemed company. But actually God says, I bring you. And I am here. And isn't that what makes church so special? That God is in this place. And God is the one ministering and using the foolishness represented in the man behind the pulpit to declare his excellencies and work the work of salvation and sanctification in his saints. 
Now, I think that it's fitting for us here, when we think about this river and this city, to see what can be a picture, an anticipation of the work of God's Spirit in the life of his people. Now, remember what Jesus says. When Jesus speaks in terms of the church, he says, the church is my temple, I dwell among them. Okay? So God dwells among his people. And then you remember what Jesus said when he says, if you thirst, come to me and drink and you'll never thirst again. We could say drink from my river, right? And then he says, if you believe in me, from your heart will flow rivers of living water. What was he talking about? He was talking about the Holy Spirit. And so I don't think that we're doing violence to the text to say we have an anticipation and a picture of God's gracious operation by his Holy Spirit in the lives of his saints, ministering the benefits of the life of the Godhead to them, delighting them with his presence, delighting them with his joy. As the Spirit is communicating to them, you belong to God, and God is with you, and he loves you with an everlasting love, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Where do those thoughts come from? The Holy Spirit. And the way the Spirit communicates to us isn't in this overwhelming, loud, and arrogant and annoying fashion, is it? No, rather, he comes to us in those gentle and soft woos upon our hearts. Or he just gently reminds us that we are beloved of God. And he says, you can come into the bosom of the Father and you can be the prodigal who was simply there resting in the arms of a forgiving father, completely accepted and completely justified. And then in this little passage, we have also a reference to deliverance. In verse 5, it says, God is in the midst of her and she shall not be moved. And then he says, and God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Now, if we were to turn back to Exodus, we would find the very same language in the words of Moses as he writes about the events that took place at the Red Sea. Let me just read for you Exodus 14 and verse 27 as Egypt has come through the Red Sea. And it says, when Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth. When? When the morning appeared. What does the psalmist say God is going to do for his people? He shall help her. When? Just at the break of dawn. It's the same language. Now, if you remember what was going on at the Red Sea, you know, the Israelites would be looking at it. They'd say, you know, this is good. He, he, he parted the sea and we're on the other side. Um, this is bad. The Egyptians are now walking in the sea and they're coming towards us. And in just at the right time, God steps in. Well, isn't that the challenge that most of us face, if we're honest? You see, we love the language of the fortress. Oh, God's my refuge, and, and uh, he's here to help me, and I like that. That's good. Okay, uh, God works on a certain timetable. He will do this just at the right time. Well, what are you talking about? I, I don't like that part. I, I, I don't even think I signed up for that. I signed up for the refuge and the fortress. I didn't sign up for a God who delays and delays and delays and then finally acts. See, my biggest problem with God, I got a lot because I'm sinful, is that he doesn't act when I want him to. But the cliche, though it's a cliche, is very true, isn't it? God is seldom early, and he is never late. And notice how God acts. All he does is simply utter his voice. In verse 6, he uttered his voice in the earth. Melt, that's all God has to do. All God has to do in your trying circumstances is just come in and utter his voice. You say, well, why doesn't he do that? Because it's not the break of dawn yet. And if you and I, in our adversity and in our trials, can just simply cling on to the fact and rest in this fortress and drink from the river of delight, knowing that God in due time will act. And so we hold on. And we keep going. Because we know that ultimately, he does everything well and he does it right. And then there is a very strong emphasis on hope. I say that because when you think about this river and its streams making glad the city of God and God dwelling with his people, if you've read your Bible cover to cover, you're very familiar with the picture that John paints in Revelation, aren't you? He says that he sees a new Jerusalem coming down out of the uh, heavens and the earth. Here it comes. And he says about this, 
that it has the tabernacle of God and that God is dwelling with man. And then he describes it and he says there's a river in it. And there's no sea. And there's no pain. And there's no tears. They're all wiped away. And there's no sorrow and there's no death. And we serve God. And we behold his face. And his name is written on our foreheads. And we get to explore for eternity the benefits of knowing this beautiful God. That's the picture that he creates. And I can't help but think that in its own way and in some measure, the psalmist is longing to point us to these things that were unfulfilled for him and yet unfulfilled for us. The fact that God has destined us to inhabit this celestial city. Now you might be asking yourself, well, what's so special about that? Why are we talking about the new Jerusalem when we're talking about trials? How, how do these things fit? Because the hope of heaven is what anchors you in the midst of your trials. You see, if God were to say, hey, I'm going to protect you right now, but when you die, that's it. Well, what's the point? Well, that's good that you want to help me now, but aren't you going to fix things? Aren't you going to make it right? And so God says to the church, I have a wonderful future plan for you. And this perspective should dramatically affect the way we go about life. We are a people full of hope. And we are a people who reject fear. Why? Because God has this plan for us. The hope of heaven strengthens and sustains us in the midst of our difficulties. And I want to say this. And I want you to pay attention. The more that you and I practice drinking from the rivers of God's delights, the more we taste of what is to come. I'm going to repeat this. The more that we drink from the river of God's delights, the more we taste of the joy that is to come. And then after the uh, expectation, we have a compelling invitation. Notice how the psalmist then turns and he speaks to perhaps the congregation or to the nations at large and he says to them, come behold the works of the Lord who's made desolations in the earth. In other words, what the psalmist is saying, the world is tottering, the sea is tottering, the nations rage, the kingdoms are moved and all these things happen. But the one centralizing point in all of this is that God holds human history in his hand. And he is the one that is working out his sovereign plan. And therefore, I don't fear. Kingdoms come and kingdoms go. But the kingdom of God remains. God is in control. Again, if you understand that God is in control, you're not going to fear, are you? And you're actually going to want people that are fearing, the nations around you or your neighbors or your loved ones. You're going to want to just stop and say this, hey, come behold this. I mean, when something is marvelous and beautiful, what do you do? Come behold this. And the psalmist is inviting us to come and to pause in a posture of tranquility and behold these marvelous truths that God reigns over the earth. And isn't this what the church is constantly to be doing? We don't need to be going around judging the world and accusing them of things and all of that. <clears throat> Rather, what we have to be doing is saying, come and look at our God with us. It's an invitation. Come and behold your king on a cross. Come and behold him who suffered and died in your stead. I wonder if you know anything about that. Have you come and beheld your king on the cross suffering for you and in your stead. And God is with us. God speaks now and he says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God now speaks and he says, be still. What's he mean? He means, it's okay. Okay. It's okay. If you have children and you've seen them panicking and flustered and all over the place, what's the first thing you try to do? Chill out. I'm here. And I'm with you. Be still and know that I am God. 
and I will be exalted among the nations. Now notice here how the psalm ends, and I want to point this out. He said this once already, but he says, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Now the Lord of hosts speaks to the fact that God is the commander of heaven's armies. And the God of Jacob speaks to the fact that God has covenanted with people. So you have here a God of all power, and then you have a God of all pity who promises. Alexander McLaren, who is highly recommendable, and especially here, says this about these names. The name, the Lord of hosts, carries um, out among the glories of the universe and shows us behind them all the personal will of which they are the servants. The name, the God of Jacob, brings us down to the tent of solitary wanderers and shows us that mighty commander and emperor enters into close, living, and tender personal relations with one poor soul. The God of all power and the God of all personality and nearness. Now all of this is what we see ultimately in God's Son, Jesus Christ. You can't read the words God with us and not think about how Jesus is named, can you? Emmanuel, God with us. And he is the one who didn't have help in his greatest trouble, did he? But the Father turned from him as our sin was placed on him. And he is the one who the very people of Jacob that God had covenanted with turned against him. And here he is on the cross, the commander of heaven's armies, crucified by the armies of Rome. Why? So that you and I can read such a passage as this and know the truthfulness of it. He is our refuge and our help and our power. And so, be still. Be still and know that he is the Lord. Thank you.